are you guys having a good time so far? Yeah. Uh, but we have saved, uh, we've saved a very special show for life. That's right. Coming up next is Calvin and Craig, and that is two people not named Calvin and Craig. Uh, they are named one guy, Chris Booth. Uh, you may have seen him on National Geographic's Brain Games. Uh, he's also uh, doing a three, he calls it a 365 project where he's trying to perform at least every day for 365 days. And he's on day 309? 310. 310. So and I think he's done like 400 plus shows. He sometimes perform multiple times, which is awesome. You can follow that on his Tumblr, which is hashtag 360project. Um, also, Kevin Labeson is another part of this duo. Kevin Labeson is the artistic director at the People's Improv Theater in New York City, which is so cool. It's an amazing improv theater in New York City. If you're ever there, check it out. The pit. It is amazing. In fact, there, I was just talking earlier today, they're expanding. They're going to have three stages, uh, which is crazy. They got two in one spot, and they're moving back to where they originally were. They originally in one spot, they moved to a bigger space, and they need more space, so they're opening up a third stage where they used to be. It's insane. Um, so go to the pit if you're ever in New York City. And guys, I, you're in for a treat. Here we go. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Calvin and similar experience. A lot of people have told me to stay hydrated, and I think, to answer your question, I think it has to do with the altitude. Ah, uh, fuck, that's that, how we found him. You just gotta this, say the word this, altitude. <laughs> this girl had some sort of experience. You know, it, could, it could have been an acknowledgement of a yes, or it could have been, uh, uh, she could have been experiencing religious ecstasy. Is that you stay hydrated because of the altitude? Yeah. What does it have to fucking do with <laughs> Uh, when you're a mile high, your you altitude sickness, so you're mostly hydrated, so you don't get headaches, nosebleeds, dizziness. That's a lot of bullshit, but I'll go with it. <laughs> <laughs> I think bottled water was invented in Denver. So I'm Chris, and that's Kevin, and we are Calvin and Craig. A two-prop show focused on absurdism. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> a two-prop show focused on absurdism, avant-garde, and alienation. That was alienation. <laughs> Tonight's episode, Traveling Pals. Calvin doesn't like to travel. He likes the idea of travel. And he likes feeling worldly. But he prefers staying in his provincial little city and taking occasional short bus trips to other cities so he can feel superior about his city. Now, when you say occasional short bus trips, yeah. do you mean that you are on a bus for a short amount of time? Or that or you are ride a short bus? That is what they call a dangling modifier problem, and I apologize for that. It was, <laughs> that was a weak uh, bit of text that I wrote, but I did mean a short bus trip because uh, I don't like to travel. So I, I prefer, uh, a, a, like, a, a, the duration of the bus trip itself, I prefer to be shorter. I imagine that shorter buses are more comfortable, but I honestly have almost no experience with that. <laughs> What's the rest of the uh, show description? I think in Improv 101, they say the quickest way to win over the audience is with a dangling modifier, and then an argument with a person not on stage. Um, Craig thinks this is pathetic. That's, I'm Craig. Um, Craig is devoting this trip to Denver to convincing Calvin that travel is more than just leisure, it is self-improvement. We all know Calvin could use some self-improvement. Because when it comes down to it, worldliness is only as good as the person in the world. 
That's how I felt the first time I read it. <laughs> Every time I read things on stage, I feel like I'm a person who was just taught to read. Uh, and that you're seeing me read for the first time. Like, like I'm part of uh, Pygmalion, like the, the B side of Pygmalion. What does that mean? Pygmalion, like the play that Bernard Shaw wrote that turned into My Fair Lady? Or Pygmalion, like the actual myth about the sculptor who made a statue and fell in love with her? It. Both, sure. I'll take that. I guess I'm confused <laughs> in terms of the like logical leap from um, reading on stage ostensibly for the first time or seeming like it's the first time and uh, the myth or the adaptation of Pygmalion. I would like for you to parse it out very specifically and slowly for my benefit, but also for the benefit of these lovely people. <laughs> <laughs> side of Pygmalion, the Bernard Shaw play, which later became My Fair Lady, because I feel as though you have created me in your image, and it's not as cool as the first play, so we're sort of like the shitty direct to video play. We're like the off-Broadway version of the Broadway version of that play. And it's much like the myth, because I think that you have fallen in love with me. You're not... Um, it would be disingenuous of me to say you were wrong. I know. I think, though, uh, in the interest of uh, things moving forward uh, comfortably as uh, working partners and as friends, uh, I think it's important that you understand that, uh, yes, of course I've fallen in love with you. Look at you. And also, why well, think with your head? Stop. <laughs> Does my touch burn your skin? I cannot do this, and I certainly cannot do this here. Well, you couldn't do it in New York in our private flat, okay. so we might as well do it here in Denver. All right. I fall apart theater. in bed one time, do you and want, that's all you do fall want? apart. Fall apart. I fell apart. Yes, <laughs> you fell apart. I'd like to go one day without you bringing that up. <laughs> I would like to go one day without that memory of that night scorched onto my brain. <laughs> Do you ask the survivor of a fire to forget the fire that licked at their skin? <laughs> Do you ask a person who almost reached Mount Everest, yet slipped and fallen, to forget the peak? I think not. <laughs> How can you make me, ask me, expect me, look at me, with those eyes, you expect me to forget that night. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> I am so sorry. My name's Kevin. <laughs> He's Kevin. <laughs> it was empty, so. <laughs> I hope you learned your lesson. <laughs> Shame so many beautiful young women have to die every year from <laughs> stray water bottles. <laughs> I think it was Tupac Shakur who said, <laughs> if my homie's not going to die at my hands, then let it be by a stray water bottle. <laughs> it's one of his later albums, released after he died. That, that right there, that's exactly why I don't trust posthumous art. <laughs> I'm 100% certain that Tupac never said anything like that. I'm 100% certain that you're correct. Because <laughs> I just invented that. The way you invented me. Stop, uh, stop it! I cannot do this! <laughs> then what can you do? Cal? Very little! <laughs> <laughs> I have the ability to show adoration, to act in the vein of affection. I have the ability to behave romantically or kindly or supportively. I have very little follow through. <laughs> oh, I know. I've seen. I'm sorry I ruined your perfect little picture. <laughs> I'm sorry that I came out here. I dare to break that wall and come out here and look you in the face and say, I'm sorry. 
I was leaving for dramatic effect. I wanted you to have a moment the way I had a moment, the way we all have a moment when we're at death's door. <laughs> and we look back on our life and we say, what the fuck was I doing? <laughs> I'd like to think that in the art, in the mind, in the heart and mind <laughs> of a performer, yes. of let's say a comedian, let's say a playful experimentalist, <laughs> That moment of what the fuck have I done, that moment just before death, that is your entire life. I believe that from breath one, all you are is the question, what the fuck was that? <laughs> That's a real serious Inception shit. That's like Inception meets Spike Lee. I like it. Keep going. Okay, so that's your cold open, right? Boom, credits begin to roll, but they're not credits. No, they're not. They're just a mirror. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Just lines of mirrors, top to bottom on the screen. I don't know how, but we can figure it out, because we have the best people on that. Right, so, thanks to the credit sequence. We enter Act 1. Now, Act 1 begins, as all Act 1s do, in a fishbowl. I don't mean a literal fishbowl. <laughs> what do you think we are, little animals? What do you think? Who the fuck do you think you are to pass by us and drop shit in above us? <laughs> do you think we just wait all day long for your your little nibbly nibbits? Just because I can't remember how many times I've looked at this castle, just because I can't remember how many times we have accidentally rubbed into each other, does not make me less than you. Just because I depend upon you to change my water or I will die in my own filth doesn't mean I owe you jack shit! And by the way, all of us dies in our own filth! <laughs> That's a fucking kick-ass act one. <laughs> we signify the transition of acts not through an intermission like they used to do in talkies or not like the, they did in uh, Brana's Hamlet, uh, but rather... A you just, mirror. You just dropped Brana's Yo, Hamlet. Son, I never <laughs> am not talking about Brana's Hamlet. Look at movies, dude! <laughs> this is so an I, I, listen, I'm not a homosexual, but I have an artistic boner. <laughs> for your visionary butthole right now. <laughs> my words to fuck your director butthole. <laughs> and I want us to make a little baby. A little baby movie. Well, let's just sign those contracts, babe. Let's just make this shit happen. <laughs> I've been doing standing meetings at work. I like it because it keeps things short, but also it keeps me fit. I mean, <laughs> fit. fit would be unfair, but it keeps me like feeling a little more active. I get it. I do a lot of sitting meetings. Yeah, that involve cheeseburgers and donuts. Those are meals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I have about five of those a day. Oh, oh no. Yes. Have you ever tried a laying though? A laying meeting? Yeah, just everyone like fucking. No. <laughs> oh, just everybody lays down. Yeah. Why is it just immediately fucking? Uh, I don't think that's such a crazy leap. A laying meeting? Like where everybody gets laid? Yeah, no, I don't work in a comedy theater, so I'm not looking to fuck people at my meetings. It's <laughs> <laughs> because I used to work in comedy theater. I mean, I was trying to fuck people in meetings long before. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, act two. Uh, well, now I'm tired of it. You give me act two. Uh, <laughs> act two, we're uncertain if the events of act one actually happen, or we're just a fever dream brought on by processed butter and overpopped popcorn. <laughs> Act two of this film will be as if Stanley Kubrick mouth fucked 
That's Stanley it. Kubrick. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Kubrick, now fuck Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick from the future, now fuck Stanley Kubrick. Two separate Stanley Kubricks, not one Stanley Kubrick who can, like, flex. No. <laughs> <laughs> Two separate, flexible Stanley Kubricks. Thereby mirroring your mirror images from Act 1. I'm dropping motherfucking atom bombs on this movie. You know what I just thought of? Have you seen that documentary, uh, Room Something Something Something, about The Shining? Yes. And one of the, like, paths they follow in that, if for those of you that haven't seen it, it is a movie about various uh, theories as to the, like, deeper inherent meanings of uh, The Shining, which is like an easy train to get on, because if you've ever seen a Kubrick movie, it's pretty clear that he's not making a lot of accidental choices. Accidental? That's not how you say that word. Anyway, one of the theories... That wasn't an accident that you said it that way. The first time it was, the second time it was. Hey, I was trying to save your life, but yeah, go ahead. It didn't go. So, <laughs> keep going. What were we talking about? Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> right. That movie, room, some... 287? 273. 237. No one cares. 237. 237. She cares. <laughs> Greg. Uh, anyway, there's uh, so you know at this point I'm like totally detached from it. I don't honestly want to. I just read an article about the woman who did all the costuming for that movie, and she talked about the fact that everyone says that the little boy, the sweater, he wore the Apollo sweater, and they're like, that's fucking proof that Kubrick like fake the moon landing. Yeah. She said she bought that sweater on the way to the shoot that day. Yeah. Well, that's of course what she would say if you were faking the moon landing. Right. Which he 100% was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stanley. So we've got dirt, we've got a dark stage, we've got lights. I don't feel good about this. I don't feel good about deceiving the American people. You know what? No one felt good about Lolita. <laughs> <laughs> How? And not a single person felt good about Barry Lyndon. We let that go. <laughs> so you're going to direct the shit out of this moon landing. I swear to God, Napoleon will never happen. I guarantee you that one day I will make a movie so completely detached from its original source material that people will question why I made that movie for years and years after. <laughs> and at least ten of those people will think that I am doing it because I am trying to express what I am actually trying to express, which is that I fake the moon landing and I do not feel good about it. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley, do you think we here at NASA feel good about any of the things that we do? Do you think we here at, at uh, the NSA feel good about most of the things we do? So we're just a bunch of people sitting around not feeling good. <laughs> a bunch of people sitting around feeling guilty about the choices we have to make. Sounds like America to me, Stanley. <laughs> Sounds like America. And that's act two. Great. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Talk to me about the transition from act two to act three. Truth start me. Start me with a word. Trample means. <laughs> Throughout. Yes. <laughs> trampolines upon trampolines. You take a trampoline, you drop it on a trampoline. The trampoline jumps. Did you ever do the thing where you take a tennis ball and a basketball and you drop them at the same time? The tennis ball is on top of the basketball. You drop them at the same time. The basketball just sort of patterns away with the fucking tennis ball takes the fuck off. Never. That sounds amazing. It's so dope. <laughs> and I wonder a lot still. I wonder a lot how far you can take that. That if there were like varying balls of sizes and elasticity or whatever, I don't know what the physics is. Uh, if you could find. Not a physicist? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> These people didn't come here today to hear not a physicist, not a, any more physicist. I flew you all the way out here for a goddamn physicist. I want to see some and hear some physicist. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> Swore it off. <laughs> Is it because of that child who died at your hands when you were trying to do emergency decisions? <laughs> Using uh, physicists with physicians. <laughs> Is that yes, because of the child who died at your hands when you were supposed to be caring for him and instead you carried him? <laughs> yes. We were so close to Mount Everest and slipped on a rock and <laughs> the 
child to break my fall. <laughs> Mount Everest for that slip? Would I expect you to forget the ledge? No. Of course I wouldn't. <laughs> Which is why I'm here today as a physicist. <laughs> a proud physicist. Doctor, physicist, MD. <laughs>
Have you heard about the marijuana I know, here? I know. <laughs> it's supposed to be very good. I know that you like this town. Yeah. And yes, it's pandering. Well, and you can do be both things. Can you be pandering and honest? Yes. Isn't pandering inherently dishonest? Pandering is wanting to be liked because of your honest feeling. Having an honest feeling is just not, not having an honest feeling. If I were to go to this man here, who surprisingly looks like Channing Tatum with a beard, and I have to say, <laughs> Channing Tatum with a beard, <laughs> find you strong like an oak, <laughs> concrete like concrete. <laughs> Warm like those little packets that you put in your gloves and keep your hands on. If I were to say that to him, and then I were just to say, good day, sir, and walk away, that's being honest. If I were to look at him and I would say, Channing Tatum with a beard, I love you because you're strong like an oak, you're concrete like concrete, and you're warm like the little packets that you put in gloves, that's pandering. <laughs> self-loathing, nebbish, New York Jew. Of course I want to be liked, Craig. <laughs> I don't think you being a self-loathing, nebbish, New York Jew has anything to do with wanting to be liked. Well, then you've Every obviously never seen a Woody Allen movie. <laughs> 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 that's, that's the last time anyone's going to get away with a Woody Allen joke, but he's not about sex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the people are expecting it. Mr. <laughs> Allen, you don't need to do an impression of yourself. <laughs> you do what you're doing. You can just be Woody Allen. I mean, I can do this. He does this a lot. Yeah. I have glasses like he does. Because you realize you're still Woody Allen right now. I don't mean to be. It's just happening. <laughs> <laughs> These are the outtakes from the end credits. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. You want to wrap this up? I think so. Hey, can we black it out? <laughs>